You are listening to part 33 of our series, Seven Medicines, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Time Monk Radio. Hi, Jim and I. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to spend time with you and with everyone who's listening in to explicate on one of my favorite themes. I've been talking about the six steps of healing or the seven medicines or the seven rivers of healing. I call it by various titles for hmm, probably 30, 35 years at this point. And it's a topic that never fails to get my interest. And I'm glad that so many other people are interested in it as well. For the past few months, we have been in the fifth river of healing. We have been in the fifth medicine. We have been in alternative medicine. And when that's one of the steps, it's the fourth step because it starts with step zero rather than one. And that is stimulate and sedate. So we started out talking about how stimulation and sedation is different from tonification and nourishment and how important it is to have remedies that can quickly change what's going on, even though um, exercise and um, eating dietary habits can often quickly change things. So they quickly change things within the realm of days or weeks, whereas often when there's an acute situation, we want to quickly change things in the realms of seconds or minutes. So a, a different kind of urgency that we have there. And we've been looking at how um, really discreet we can be in terms of stimulating and sedating, how there's a range of stimulants and a range of sedatives. And just so, there's also a range of practices within alternative medicine. And each of, shall we say, the great practices of herbal medicine has its own take on what is going on with you and how best to treat you. And so this month, we're going to be looking at several more of those great pillars of alternative medicine. The Fifth River Use Alternative Medicine last month. In addition to herbal stimulants and sedatives, we looked at acupuncture and body work, all kinds of different body work, including massage. And this month, we're going to be looking at hydrotherapy, chiropractic, naturopathy, osteopathy, and a little bit more at herbalism. Since, after all, I'm an herbalist before we leave alternative medicine, I do want to talk a little more generally about herbalists and herbalism and how that fits into working with these great rivers of healing. I also want to remind us when we're thinking about these ways of working in healthcare that they also can be thought of as having to do with different ways of thinking. So we have the scientific way of thinking which is about measuring and fixing. We have the heroic way of thinking, which is about cleansing and balancing. And we have the wise woman way of thinking, which is about nourishing wholeness. It may come as a surprise to many listeners who would assume that everybody who's doing alternative medicine thinks about it in the same way, but it's simply not true. You can have a scientific tradition chiropractor, a heroic tradition chiropractor, and why some a tradition chiropractor. You can go to an herbalist who's deeply involved in the scientific tradition, or an herbalist who really believes in the heroic tradition, or an herbalist who practices in the wise woman tradition. So when we're in the realm of alternative medicine, we need to keep our good friends, the three traditions, close at hand so that we can also ask ourselves, this person who's doing this alternative practice, in what way are they thinking about doing the alternative practice? Now, just as we know 
that anyone who's a medical doctor has been trained and trained pretty exclusively in the use of drugs and surgery. And so those are going to be the first things that they kind of think of, although they may know other things and if pushed may even offer you those other things. So a doctor who says you have high blood pressure and wants to get your blood pressure down is first going to be think about drugs. And it's first going to think about the modern recommendation, which is to use several drugs at once to get that blood pressure down right away. But if pushed, we'll admit that she or he probably knows that meditation will lower blood pressure too and could even be convinced to let you give that a trial before you start doing the drugs. So it helps to remember these three traditions and to ask yourself, about them, because even if you're going to someone alternative, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're thinking the way you are thinking. This week, let's look at hydrotherapy. I think it's pretty clear what hydrotherapy is. It's like hydraulics. It has to do with water. In fact, the definition of hydrotherapy is the curative use of water. This is a little general, and of course it could mean anything from um, dunking people in water, such as in an isolation tank where you're actually floating in water with enough salt in it to make you very, very buoyant to uh, directing streams of uh, pressurized and temperature-controlled water against various areas of your body. So let's look a little bit deeper into hydrotherapy. Clearly, it's alternative medicine. Many of us um, seek out hydrotherapy on our own, and we could call it a hot bath. All right. If hydrotherapy is the curative use of water, a hot bath for many people is definitely hydrotherapy. It is relaxing. It is calming. It calms the nervous system. It loosens the muscles. It brings about a state in which the body can work and function far more effectively. More and more people having once experienced being in a tub of hot water with water jets seek to have that available to them as often as they want it. So hydrotherapy is something that humans rather, shall we say, um, intuitively seek out when we're at the river, we like the shallow water, but we also go to where the waterfalls are because we like the feeling of the water kind of pounding down on our shoulders. Or for some of us, a shower is preferable to a bath because we like that sensation of the water coming down on us. For others, it's running outside in the rain And again, getting that feeling of the water and the water from above coming down on to your body. It is not for nothing then that hydrotherapy continues to not just be an alternative healing technique that we seek out on our own in waterfalls, in hot baths, in um, home spas, as well as all kinds of spas with wonderful waters that are found around the world, but also as a profession, as a profession in which disability, injury, or illness is treated by immersing all or part of the body in water. One of the most Interesting treatments that I've received, and I received some very interesting treatments as I seek them out, is something called Watsu. 
And it's supposed to be a combination of shiatsu and water. So it's a shiatsu massage that is done while you are held up floating on your back by the practitioner and moved in various ways. I'm sure that the kind of patter that goes along with that, which is very spiritually charged patter about Mother Earth and Father Sky, is not what a regular hydrotherapist would do. They, in fact, have training and know how to facilitate the rehabilitation after trauma in water, the reuse of body parts after trauma in water. I know for myself, once again, following intuitive wisdom of my own body, when I have had trauma to the large areas of my body, I have sought out after the healing has been pretty complete to rehabilitate that area by swimming or by doing supported exercise in water. One of the reasons that I've always sought that out is because it provided me with range of motion to be able to increase the motion of the joint and the muscle in question, but having it supported on all sides so that it didn't even have to bear its own weight, that the water could bear that weight. Hydrotherapy is currently used for relief of pain. And it's nice to know that, uh, again, what we all feel, what we all believe, which is, wow, my pain goes away when I soak in hot water, when I run hot water on the affected part, is backed up by not just hundreds of years of experience, but by some really good science as well. A lot of changes go on in the muscle tissues and the joint structure when we soak ourselves in hot water or when we allow hot water to come on us with pressure from a nozzle or a hose or a shower or so on. What's your connection with hydrotherapy? I, um, this past spring, did an isolation tank or a float tank, as they call them here, um, and it was lovely. Yes, I think we'd have to put a float tank in um, our very first river, the River of Serenity. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. You couldn't tell where your body ended and where the water began. Exactly. And that's partly because the water is at body temperature. Yes. And you cannot not float in there. Right. There's enough salt in the water that you absolutely float. Yes. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and and the idea is to take away any abrasive sensory input and for all sensory input to be like reset at zero. That's what it felt like. And you couldn't see anything. Your eyes never adjusted because there wasn't any light at all. Um, you couldn't hear anything except your own breathing because your ears were under the water. So it was, it felt like a reset. Yes. Yes. And then are you a, a hot bath person, a shower person, a hot tub? I like a hot bath or a jacuzzi bath type of um, any kind of water, actually, but I do like baths. I've walked great distances with people to get to natural springs. There's some wonderful mm -hmm. natural springs um, in Oregon. Uh, one that I went to where right next to each other was a very cold spring and a very hot spring. Oh, that's interesting. We have hot springs in Arkansas as well. Yes. Yes, where we go in um, Costa Rica, where I teach at the EDGE conference, is at a Cermale, which is a, a hot, a series of hot springs. There's a lot of volcanic area there, and uh, so there's lots of hot springs that bubble up. And one of the springs there, I think it's like, a, it's, you know, practically boiling temperature. Mm -hmm. I think 114, 
<laughs> it's like at your own risk getting this right. water. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have, I have found that while we appreciate hot water, um, it takes some um, getting used to to appreciate the cold water. I agree. <laughs> One of the things that I did when I was first living here on my land and as soon as I had the teepee set up was that I spent my nights out in the teepee and I would get up every morning and I would jump in the pond. And the pond is spring fed and the water is very, very, very cold. And I realized the morning that I jumped in and my breathing stopped, that that had to be the last morning that I did that for the year. <laughs> yes. Because that very, very cold water, it does, it causes a kind of shock reaction that is also a reset. It's a different kind of reset than the, oh, everything is so peaceful, nice. It's a kind of <gasps> reset, but it is also that it's like a wake up call. Yes. <laughs> to, yes, to your body. And so I think about, you know, some of the things that my early teachers were involved in. One used to use, if someone had a sinus headache, she would have them get a foot bath with ice in it and a foot bath with really hot water in it. And then they would get a hot towel and some frozen vegetable. And they were supposed to put their feet in the hot water and the frozen vegetable on their sinuses and then switch off and put their feet in the ice water and the hot towel on their sinuses and keep switching back and forth about every 20 or 30 seconds. And what she believed was that this created a pump. Did that work for migraines as well or just your typical sinus headaches? It could. It's kind of a lot of trouble, but it's worth trying. Sure. And the idea is that when the blood vessels are hot, they relax. And then when they're cold, they constrict. And so by switching them back and forth and by switching the two ends opposite, that you get a big kind of pump of blood going through the body and break up tension. Have you tried that? Well, I generally don't get sinus headaches. Yeah, I don't and, either. Yeah, and the one time that I did, I decided to try her other remedy, which was to put a clothespin on the end of each toe for a sinus <laughs> headache. Because with, uh, you know, all due respect, it's a lot easier than getting all these tubs of water. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> clothespin. I'll have to remember that before I start getting all the water together. <laughs> Uh, hydrotherapists say that the the use of water is really excellent in promoting wound healing too and I've seen that for myself I often say to people why did they tell you at the hospital to keep your wound dry and they say because it heals better and I say no because they don't want their stitches to pull out the fact is that wounds heal much much better if they're kept wet And the wetter the wound is, the less likely it is to scar and the faster it will heal usually. And this is one of the reasons why herbalists so frequently use poultices. So we see that hydrotherapy is something that we seek out on our own. It's something that we we have an intuitive sense of this is going to relieve my pain, promote my healing, right? Help help me after trauma, help strengthen my muscles. But we also see that it can become more specific and more directed if we've had a bigger trauma and we need help from a physical therapist, we can ask for hydrotherapy in addition. Nowadays, what we tend to use, rather than hydrotherapy, rather than the immersion in water, are um, ice packs that we put in the freezer or take out of the freezer when we want to use them, or things that we put in the microwave. I see a lot of people using those kinds of things. Do you? 
Yeah, I I no longer have a microwave, but when I did, it was like filled with this rice type of material, and when you'd heat it up, it it have some moisture. It was a moist heat, and yes. put on your neck or your shoulders. It really felt quite wonderful. Right, and that's partly for the reasons that I decided to put clothespins on my toes. Right. Right. <laughs> Hydrotherapy is messy. It we you know it requires. Rooms, tubs, bathing apparatus, towels, all of that, whereas the kinds of poultices that people tend to use, which are easier to use, are enclosed. As you say, you know, it was a poultice that had some rice already sewn in it. You could put it in the microwave when you had one, and it would get, have the moist heat, and you could put it on, and you didn't have to worry about Staining your clothing or staining the furniture or kicking over the poultice or making a mess. That's about the worst of the downside to hydrotherapy. And we are past the great divide. So these alternative therapies are going to have some difficulties. And uh, I always say the biggest difficulty with hydrotherapy is it's all wet. But, of course, as we understand, we could actually um, burn ourselves by using water that's too hot. Um, That hot pool in the Thermales de Bosque could, in fact, burn you. We could damage ourselves by using water that's too cold. When I was using ice packs on the wrists that I hurt last year, I was reading up about how some people have actually given themselves frostbite by using an ice pack and leaving it on too long and going right past the point where they didn't notice that they didn't have any sensation in their flesh anymore, or um, using friction on skin that has been soaked in water, and the skin kind of gets a little loose from its mooring, and it's really easy to braid or rub off the skin at that point. We pretty much have to admit that the downsides of the hydrotherapy are pretty small. And that's one of the reasons why we all feel so comfortable with it. People often complain to me, and we talked about this when we were talking about massage, about um, my choice to put massage and hydrotherapy here with the alternative remedies. And they say, well, couldn't you just call them a lifestyle thing? And I said, well, With the first four rivers of healing, what we want to see is things that are actually going to build health. And while hydrotherapy, hot and cold poultices, hot and cold water, these kinds of things really do help us, they don't actually tonify. They can help us get more toned. We can use this to move through and to do more exercise. So they can kind of bridge that gap. As I said, you know, we can go swimming. We can use that muscle, support that. So that's a way to use a kind of hydrotherapy because we're immersed in the water. That is definitely a lifestyle choice. But mostly what we're doing when we're using hydrotherapy is exactly what this kind of healing does, and that is to stimulate and sedate, to help take us from one place in our healing journey to a softer place in our healing journey so that we can then go back yet to yet a better place in our healing journey, which is back across the Great Divide and into lifestyle medicine. So we let the hydrotherapy, we let the support of the water help us strengthen our weak muscles, but just floating in the water doesn't do it. We have to move the muscle ourselves. We have to exert that effort. We can acknowledge that being immersed in water helps us to get more mobility in the joint and to use the joint better. But again, it's not just floating in the water that does that. We actually have to learn and do range of motion exercises with a joint in the water or work with somebody who does hydrotherapy and think about or talk to them about a variety of temperatures for using that water. About the only place that hydrotherapy works by just sticking something in water and letting it soak is in wound healing. And there we don't have to do too much. 
But again, we are not promoting health. We're simply healing a wound there and or relieving pain. I think that hydrotherapy is a really good example of the distinctions that I make between alternative medicine, which has a focus at relieving or curing, and lifestyle medicine, which the focus is to prevent rather than to relieve or to cure. As we move into the other alternative medicines this month, chiropractic, naturopathy, osteopathy, and herbalism, we will see how these, again, have ways that they can somewhat bridge the gap back to lifestyle medicine and how they, especially when they are used as healing techniques, are alternative medicine. They're on this side of that gap. So that's about it for this week. And um, I will encourage you to um, report back to us next week as to your favorite bath. All right. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Green blessings, everyone. <laughs> this concludes part 33 of our series, The Seven Medicines, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Wade at Time Monk Radio.